the hallmark of a great scientist is identifying a great opportunity, something that most people would walk by but bothers you greatly, and then deciding how much effort are you going to put into to resolve this sort of thing that bothers you. So, once you find a great opportunity, how do you go about exploring it? Let's find out. Listen as Harmeet Malik shares his experience taking a simple idea and nurturing it through exploration. Through Harmeet's story, we learn about the rewards that can come from taking a small, naive idea and running with it. Because bringing energy, excitement, and relentlessness to a new project might just pay off tremendously in the long run. You've found Eureka. All right, my name is Harmeet Malik. I'm a full professor in the Division of Basic Sciences. Harmeet is the co-associate director of a research lab at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, who studies genetic conflict, or the competition between genomes that drives evolutionary change. His eagerness to explore new frontiers has led to important discoveries in the evolutionary arms race between viruses and their hosts. The implications of these discoveries for the field of evolutionary biology and human disease prevention have earned Harmeet several prestigious awards and gotten him elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. If you came across a brand new gene and you didn't know anything about it, what's the first experiment you would do to try to learn something about it? For me, it actually is not a hypothetical. This is how we do most of our work, uh, is that we are interested in the evolutionary history and the evolutionary constraints that shape that gene. Because to us, that actually tells us a lot about what the gene might be doing, whether it's involved in some sort of housekeeping function or whether it might be involved in the kinds of evolutionary arms races that we study. So then what, if, what would you say then when you crystallize, like what would be the first, and it's okay to get technical here, what's the first experiment that you would do? What approach would you take? Our first approach would be entirely computational. Because of the types of organisms we study, we would basically look uh, using blast searches, etc., to trace back the evolutionary history of the gene, of when it might have been born, how far it goes. And then by comparing close orthologs of the gene, we try to identify what are the evolutionary constraints that shape different parts of the gene. Is it rapidly evolving? Is it slowly evolving? So essentially through everything we can in the matter of just a couple of hours to learn everything we can computationally about that gene, its evolutionary context and its potential protein domain. How much do you think you can learn from the genomic conservation versus uh, proteomic or, or the conservation of a protein, amino acid side chain and or side chain properties? Yeah, that question somewhat depends on how in detail we go. Certainly we'll get to a state where we are going to be in a position to ask things about side chain and, and curiosities. But at a very first blush, we are interested in what is the overall architecture of the gene and whether we can actually infer something about its putative function based on when it arose, as well as what the different domains it encodes for. Frequently, we also find that we do actually have some cases of de novo genes, which actually really came about from nothing. What was previously an untranslated part of the genome started encoding for a protein function. In those cases, we have absolutely no guide or homology. And so really everything needs to be done functionally. But for most other genes that are in the genome that have any kind of evolutionary history, uh, we are able to actually make some really good first guesses entirely based on computational history. So then what I want to do now is transition slightly. And I'm curious about this idea about this, what you describe as an evolutionary arms race. And so this is where I want you to take us back and to tell us where did that concept arise for you? And what was it about that idea and that question that, that really lights you up or really got you excited? So this actually goes back to pretty much my roots in, in terms of my interest in biology. When I was a engineering student in India, I was actually a major in chemical engineering and I had really no biology except for the little biology I had done as a high schooler. And I picked up completely by accident the book, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, who talked about how selfishness is actually a pervasive concept in biology. And as it so turns out, I was also learning introductory molecular biology as, you know, a part of an additional curriculum that I'd taken on. And those two parts of biology just completely felt like they were clashing with each other. On the one hand, 
we had this perfectly engineered system of, you know, interlocking gears that sort of really worked. And on the other hand, I was learning that that kind of engineering system really should be constantly challenged by the fact that there were always low rogue players arising at every aspect, every sort of level of biology, there was some sort of selfishness at play. And obviously the fact that biological entities exist, genomes exist and organisms exist means that we found a way to adjust to both of these realities that there is in fact a strong need for housekeeping functions and engineering principles within the cell, but also a, a need to accommodate the fact that there will be constant selfishness that's encountered and needs to be suppressed. I really had no idea what I was getting into, except for this very naive idea that actually it would be a really good idea to combine molecular biology with uh, this aspect, which is traditionally the daily work of uh, evolutionary biologists. And in a sense that that remains true, there are traditional molecular biologists and what I would refer to as traditional evolutionary biologists, but more and more interesting work is actually being done by people who are traversing both of these fields, where they're actually finding exciting molecular rationale and reasoning to explain things that we had taken for granted in the evolutionary world, but now we actually have a very good molecular understanding. And what's actually been the most really pleasing aspect of this is that this has actually told us not just interesting things about evolutionary biology, but actually interesting things about the molecular underpinnings of the cell, which is what we were hoping to find. So we're actually getting insights on both directions. So you've said a couple of times housekeeping versus some other types of functions. What do you mean by that? And, and I guess, where do you draw the distinction between some housekeeping, meaning the genes that sort of keep the cell alive going along versus some of these other functions? Yes, yeah, sometimes the distinction is not so apparent. The way I would interpret housekeeping genes are uh, genes that if you were to take that organism and, and put it in an environment that's entirely devoid of competition from other parasites, other organisms, et cetera, uh, this organism would, would thrive. And so these are the genes which are necessary for the intrinsic survival of the organism. And I contrast that with genes that are essential for the organisms to survive the onslaught of pathogens and other sort of fitness competitors uh, in the same space. That's really necessary for the extrinsic survival, if you will, of the organism. Of course, we don't live in hermetic balloons, so we are constantly challenged for both uh, things. But one of them is actually a challenge that is uh, constant in the sense that you need to generate ATP through your mitochondria. That is a constant. If you're a eukaryote, you need to do that. And yet, the types of pathogens you encounter could change quite dramatically, even in the space of, for example, if you're facing a viral attack. One of the challenges, the engineering challenges for the cell are more constant, whereas the pathogen challenges, the extrinsic challenges could actually change quite dramatically. And therefore, we expect that the cell itself the, or the genome adapts in these two cadences. One cadence is actually very slow. It really involves constant tinkering and adaptation, but at a very micro scale. And the other is a wholesale turnover of genes and very rapid evolution where you're constantly breaking the sort of speed limit that mutation can afford to you so that selection can act on the fodder and, and allow you to basically keep pace with the uh, changing pathogen. So then you said that you were a young engineering student and you talked about this idea of cross-pollination and how someone from a different field can often explore a new field with perhaps naive and untainted perception and perspective. So with then you were reading the selfish gene and you were learning molecular biology. What was next? I actually began to consider the somewhat heretical idea that I would actually uh, do a PhD in biology, even though I had really done one uh, lecture, which didn't even appear in my transcripts on introductory molecular biology. So I had really essentially zero experience reading original scientific literature than trying to understand everything I read came from science books, as well as what I was taught from textbooks and from my kind of professor. What actually really made it for me was the fact that the professor himself was uh, there to overcome my uh, significant anxiety about this transition and, and basically pointing out that I'm pretty confident that you can actually uh, make this work, even though I understand that you're not as uh, qualified in terms of what you compared to some of the other people who would be going to graduate school. Essentially, what I found was that there is, in fact, such a thing as having the intuition for the subject that you love. When I came to, I came to the U.S. because it turned out that I was 
very uncompetitive for PhD positions in India because I just really did not have the background knowledge that they needed for me to do well in their entrance exams, whereas I actually did relatively well in terms of applying to U.S. schools. And my very first semester in graduate school, I was teaching genetics to undergraduates as a teaching assistant, having never taken genetics before. So it was a pretty nice crash course in genetics where I uh, was learning maybe a few hours before based on the lecture materials and then leading recitation sections. And I had all of these notes to myself, including mnemonics that I had come up for myself to remember things. And my undergraduate students uh, one day saw my lecture notes and said whether they could just have copies. So I started just freely printing them out for them and I became a very popular TA. And honestly, it was it's still one of my strongest suits is genetics because I was learning in this somewhat crisis mode, but also it was really important for me to make sure that I got everything. It was not just something that I could regurgitate, having not fully understood the material. I really needed to understand the material so I could teach it uh, to my students. Yeah, it sounds like a trial by fire, sir. Yeah. So then tell us then about the graduate works. You began to explore this idea of genetics, essentially some of these the transposable elements or, or the idea that there's this uh, constant and, and eventual rapid evolution um, that's happening. So how did you begin to explore it? Yeah, so I had actually, even from India, really applied to a few graduate programs. This was the very nascent days of the internet where we, in, instead we wrote to graduate departments and they sent us these brochures with professors' interests and I highlighted professors who were working on transposable thinking that's what I want to work on. And I was actually lucky enough to be admitted to the University of Rochester and to join the lab of my who, somebody who became my graduate advisor, Mike Bush. And Tom was actually almost an ideal kind of graduate advisor for me because I joined the lab thinking I'd want to study the molecular mechanisms of transposable elements. But actually, what I didn't know was that my true aptitude was to actually decipher the evolutionary origins and relationships between transposable elements. And even though I joined as a molecular biology student, I spent more, more, most of my time in graduate school working on more of the evolutionary questions. And, and Tom was literally the only person in the entire department who was a faculty member in both evolutionary biology and molecular biology. So it was a stroke of luck that I was able to join his lab. And one of those being in the right place at the right time things where learning from Tom, it was just a really nice opportunity for me to apply. Basically, I was starting from scratch, but so was the rest of the field. So I was not significantly behind and I, I could actually make a significant impact through discoveries I made as a PhD student. Can you, in the simplest terms you can, describe what you mean by transposable element or transposon? Yeah. So we think about transposable elements as elements that are like rogue mercenaries. Typically, when we think of a gene, its inheritance to future generations is tied to the inheritance of the genome, which means if you have one copy of a gene in your genome, your kids will have you know one copy of that gene in their genomes and so on and so forth. Transposable elements actually uh, defeat this Mendelian inheritance by over-replicating. They can increase the number of copies they make of themselves and jump into different sites in the genome therefore increasing their evolutionary success relative to their host genomes. Some of them can also jump from one genome to another genome and therefore not only increase their impact in the genomes they were born in, but also transfer themselves to other uh, genomes. And the line begins to blur even between what's a transposable element and what you would consider a virus that can again infect other individuals. In fact, many retrotransposons that I studied in graduate school are the progenitors to the retroviruses that we think about, like HIV, et cetera, where having picked up the ability to infect new cells, what was first a transposable element that jumped around in the genome became a virus that could now jump between species. So these are basically elements that we think about as increasing their uh, relative proportion in the genome at the expense often to the rest of the genome. So you were telling us then at the end of graduate school or in graduate school, you're able to make an impact in the field because everybody was at the beginning. It's interesting though, because if you're at the beginning of something, one of the benefits is you could go a hundred different directions, but one of the challenges is you can go a hundred different directions. So how do you then decide, or how did you decide 
which direction you wanted to explore? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think some of that's where I credit Tom with a lot of mentorship because I had a lot of energy and enthusiasm. I was spending nights in the lab because it was easy to get onto the computer. Bandwidth was great and I was not competing with the rest of the department, etc. He was able to craft like a set of questions for me that allowed me to constrain my energy to do something interesting. It turns out though, actually, I could have gone down any number of different directions and they would have all been fruitful, except that what was great was that Tom was already studying in the molecular side of his lab an aspect of these transposable elements, which was a mystery. So for example, these transposable elements we knew encoded an endonuclease. It was a very site-specific endonuclease, almost like a restriction enzyme, which meant that they cut exactly at one side of the genome, but we had absolutely no idea what the endonuclease domain was. So even though there were people in the lab who were focused on biochemistry and had actually really focused on biochemistry nearly a decade before I joined the lab, that was a very simple question was, can I use evolutionary biology and this kind of computational approach to at least come up with some hypotheses as to what the endonuclease domain was? And that actually turns out to be one of like the main findings from my graduate thesis was that we had been looking in the sea. Harmit is describing here his graduate work to find a specific part of an endonuclease that cuts DNA. Now, imagine a children's story. It's got a hero and a villain, and Harmit was looking for the villain. Up until this point, every other children's story began, once upon a time, there was a loud villain, there was a quiet villain, there was an old, tired villain. Every children's story introduced the villain right at the beginning. And so, that's where everyone looked, at the beginning sequences, right after the words, once upon a time. Harmit decided to take a different approach. Instead, he looked across the story for the words that were similar to villain, scoundrel, criminal, sinner, anti-hero. And sure enough, he found it almost at the end of the story. In the framework of the larger problem, but that allowed me to corral my energies to really address that mini piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And when we start with a jigsaw puzzle, sometimes we know there's a thousand pieces, but in bioinformatics, you don't even know how big the puzzle is or how many pieces there are or what pieces are missing. So you'll never actually finish parts of the puzzle. So some people are very daunted by the open-endedness of this kind of puzzling. Um, I was really excited about it because I knew that even if I made small pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, that will actually tell me a lot. Even if I never assembled the entire puzzle, I would be actually still making significant inroads. And that was just the way I approached my PhD was that making these small puzzles and answering actually a number of similar questions about biochemical domains, showing that the retrotransposons were the progenitors for the retroviruses. You mentioned to me before the power of computational tools what were some of the key differences between the computational tools that were available during your graduate work compared to now? I think one of the differences is that we, we just have a lot more horsepower in terms of the computational tools. All of NCBI, all of the sequence databases in NCBI that existed cumulatively when I was in graduate school, 10 times that amount of sequences being deposited in NCBI on a daily basis today. And so the horsepower needed to just do any kind of analysis on, on the order of what I did when I was in graduate school requires a much more in-depth understanding of computational biology, you know, training in bioinformatics that honestly I did not have. I had a lot of intuition and I had the ability to uh, put together these puzzles, but I did not have the ability to robustly write my own code to go in and like search for these databases. And students today are much in a much better sense um, trained to do exactly that, to keep up with the complexity of the databases that actually exist. I will say though that it was both a blessing and a, and a curse in a way. The curse was I couldn't do things very efficiently. The blessing was that it forced me to ask the questions that I felt really mattered, right? So rather than fully describe and get more and more to the diminishing returns aspect of the problem, I was able to answer the problem, where is this particular endonuclease encoded, then switch to a different problem, et cetera, and answer really deep problems. And one of the reasons I began to appreciate was it was okay for me to make all kinds of computational hypotheses, but unless somebody was actually willing to test them using genetic or biochemical means, that's all they were. They're just hypotheses that, and ultimately the person who proved 
that this was in fact the case would be the one who would basically get the credit, but also be the one who definitively solved the problem. So that really uh, ingrained in me this need to train myself into both kind of wet lab as well as computational bi lab biology. So even though I was a lot more successful on the computational side, I found a lot of meaning in my training on the bench in terms of devising genetic experiments, doing a little bit of rudimentary biochemistry that allowed me to traverse both of these landscapes. So I, I didn't become a specialized computational person. I didn't become a specialized uh, geneticist. I was a little bit of a hybrid. You said something that I think is incredibly important that I want to get back to. You essentially described this dynamic process of explore and then to focus down and evaluate. And you talked about the curse and the blessing of not having this unlimited computational horsepower and tools that you need to then focus. How do you think about this balance between exploring and coming back to, to evaluate, to focus and to test an idea? Yeah, I have to do this for myself. I also have to do this for trainees in my lab. And the best analogy I give them is imagine giving a seminar where you have 20 minutes to give a, a really great seminar. Now you could spend 20 minutes telling them about all of the great things you've done. 20 minutes later, people will remember absolutely nothing from your seminar. Instead, if you actually focus all of your 20 minutes on one topic, why you did it, what you found, what are the implications, even a year later, somebody might remember what a great talk you gave, trade-off, where you might be tempted to think that actually doing a lot in a shallow level is actually like a great way to make an impact, maybe get a number of papers out. But actually, where you're likely to make a really big difference is where you went deep at just the right points. The hallmark of a great scientist is identifying a great opportunity, something that most people would walk by but bothers you greatly because it doesn't fit what we know, and then deciding... How much effort are you going to put into to resolve this sort of thing that bothers you? And that's really been by the heart of the work that we do in my lab. I was really bothered by the fact that there were these rapidly evolving domains in proteins that are completely housekeeping genes, completely essential for the cell intrinsically. And I started with the premise that there must be something beyond what we knew about their functions that drove their evolution. And that led me to consider that even though these proteins are intricate cogs in the wheel of the cell, they might be participating in some sort of evolutionary arms race. So you could actually have this dual existence where the same genes were doing the essential functions, but were also participating in arms races. And that's something where, you know, just looking at the uh, rates at which these genes evolve in the genome, anybody would come up with the same observation. But I think the, the credit lies in sort of people who stopped and said, that doesn't make sense. And the people who said, yes, that doesn't make, make sense. And now I'm going to do experiments to actually figure out why it doesn't make sense. You talked a little bit about the balance between this exploration versus focusing on something. What are some of the lessons that you try to impart on your own lab members and trainings? Yeah, so I've thought about this a lot. Like I, I actually spend a significant chunk of my sort of brain power thinking about this and in the beginning, I must confess that it started off simply as a way to compete for the very best postdocs and students was just to give them an environment where I would get, give them a lot of attention. They would have a chance to develop their own program. And it was almost like if you're a postdoc coming to my lab, why would you come to my lab? I was a junior faculty who was a nobody in, in the field. And they were also interviewing in some of the other top labs in the business. And the way I enticed them was twofold. One was I wanted to create an environment where I was not going to be their only mentor. They would have a co-mentorship relationship with other more seasoned colleagues who would actually both act as scientific as well as career mentors because I wanted them to be successful. And the second was that I said that if you come in and you start a project, when you leave here, I will stop working on this. So we will have an opportunity to work on a really cool problem that I'll help you think about. And in some cases, at least in the beginning, was projects that I was already working on. I said, but if you come here and you work on this, you can completely take away this project and I will basically not be working on this. As soon as you leave, you'll pack everything up and, and do that. And I did that in the beginning thinking that's, I can afford to do that. There's lots of cool projects around. There's not that many cool pro postdocs around who'd want to work with me. So it was easy. But then it also 
became just a really creative way for me to just stay fresh. By the time they leave the lab, the postdocs who are leading the project are the experts. If I care about the project at all, I want them to take the project away because they're the, they're the experts. They're the ones who are really the people driving that particular project. This approach where like really awesome, great projects leave the lab at, at some frequency means I'm constantly looking for exciting things that sort of move us in new directions, but not in a permanent way, because again, that's another four or five year investment that then forces that way. So we've kept some uh, bread and butter projects sort of that is going to be our projects, including the Centromere work. That's a what I would view as a bread and butter project for our lab. But then we also have this somewhat roving carousel of projects that will be where we can devote a lot of creative energies possibly in the most riskiest phase of that particular project. And then the bigger legacy is that we have a number of really fantastic alumni from the lab who are all really doing very well in their own kind of spheres. So then what do you say now to the young student or young postdoc who is uh, considering your lab? What we basically have is we select for people who are not as risk averse because there is a risk associated coming to a lab, start a new project, which means that you're benefiting from the intellectual environment that we've created to do this kind of project building. A little bit of resources that we've built in. The only safety net is that we will basically watch out for your success. But otherwise, you're really building this from scratch with us. And some people are really excited about that opportunity. Other people are probably prefer to come to the lab because they want to take advantage of some tools or some sort of a legacy that the lab's already built up in the field. And those people tend not to come to my lab. The people who really come to the lab are the ones who are really excited about the prospects of creating a creative legacy from them such that they don't really even have to worry about. When people describe the project, even though it was actually done in my lab, including postdocs who are currently in the lab, they don't describe it as my project. They actually describe it as that postdocs project because that's really the way it is. They're the intellectual leaders of that. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about and questioning, like, how do you know then when to stop exploring and to double down and try to test something? Or when do you think you have enough ideas that you then can select the best one from? Yeah, I lose sleep at night thinking about this question because there there have been instances where we've, we've, we've not been successful. I can't tell you that every project that we've done has been successful. And sometimes it's been not successful because it was not as intellectually exciting as we thought it would be or novel. Other times it's been because even though we thought it would be novel, we were just up against like technical hurdles that we could not overcome. Frequently, these projects require us to also think about what's the best model organism or system for us to answer this question. That has led us to adopt uh, models that we don't actually work on. So we are always making sure that the cadence of productivity of the postdoc is actually as far as uh, you can tell, is always there. So if their plan A, the creative risky project falls through, it's not that they've just lost two, three years of productivity without anything to show for it. But most of the time, the plan B project is one that I suggested to them in their interview. And the plan A project is something that they came up with themselves. And in some cases, the postdocs have taken both the plan A and plan B projects to their own lab because they also recognize the need to have this kind of diversified portfolio. But I think what you're basically describing is really what we call the diversified portfolio. You cannot always be doing completely risky projects because there's a real risk that your lab could fail or flounder or or be really a nervous wreck by the time this is over. Or you cannot actually be completely conservative because then it's not, you're not really being intellectually innovative. It's really this mix between the two. And So then if we begin to wrap up and we just think about looking forward, we talked a little bit about computational tools that allow us some exploration. We talked to about the risk portfolio. We talked about some of the differences, with the science that you uh, cut your teeth in compared to today. What do you think that looks like in the future, specifically the role that computation will play and of course more data than ever before, but then also the pressure to mitigate risk, the pressure from the funding agencies and so on, that really is antithetical to, to being risky and trying to make discoveries and Yeah, that's an excellent question, Matthew. I I cannot uh, emphasize how we've been very lucky because a lot of the work in our lab, right from the time I started my lab, has been funded by foundation grants where they were not very risk averse. And if if your projects were successful, then you get renewed again 
for another five years, but they're really looking for it. It seems a little bit like a Darwinian term, but it's really they're looking for things that pass the deletion test, which is something that I've really ingrained upon myself. These are not necessarily all the projects that go end up in the pages of, you know, the holy trinity of cell nature science. These are often projects that take some time to invest in, and it takes some time to even convince people that this is actually a really interesting line of research even in their failures will actually tell us something really interesting about things we don't know. Parmeet, this has been fantastic. I want to thank you again for taking some time to tell us your story. Thank you very much, Matt. Be well. Take care of yourself. Thanks for joining us to hear Harmit's story. His research on genetic conflict and how it drives evolutionary change can not only help us understand diseases like HIV and cancer, but also how new species evolve. Harmit's success in his field proves that dedicating yourself to the exploration of an idea can lead to breakthrough discoveries, and maybe even a new field of scientific research. If you like this story, give us a review on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and give more people the opportunity to learn from the world's best scientists. Special thanks to the Eureka Stories team. Our sound editing is done by Anna Markey. Our copywriter is Nicole Kagan. And our media and website team members are Benjamin Asumani and Matthew Norman. To stay up to date, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Eureka Labs. You can also find show notes, transcripts, and video on our website, stories.eurekalabs.org. That's stories.h-e-u-r-e-k-a-l-a-b-s.org. You've found Eureka.